some of you went to Gokul Mahavan today? Yes? Or tomorrow or the next day? Today is Diwali, and with your permission, on this very illuminating day, I will speak some few words about Gokul Mahavan. The Srimad Bhagavatam tells in quite elaborate details how Lord Sri Krishna appeared in Mathura as the beloved of Devaki and Vasudev. In those pages of Srimad Bhagavatam, It is revealed in more subtle ways that Krishna also was born of Nanda and Yashoda in Gokul. Some of our acharyas including Srila Jiva Goswami, elaborate on how that transcendental pastime manifested. It is explained there that there was a great king of the Yadu dynasty named Deva Mitta, who was based in the kingdom of Mathura. And he had two wives, as was traditional often in those days for kings. One of his wives was born of a Kshatriya family and another from a Vaishya family. From the wife of the royal dynasty, he gave birth to Surasena. And from the farmer family daughter, he gave birth to Parjanya. Surasena ruled over the kingdom of Mathura and the Yadu dynasty. His principal son was Vasudev. Parjanya went to Gokul or Brihad Mahavan and he became such a beloved leader for all the Gopas and Gopis who would grow crops, raise cows and bulls, it is said that Parajanya, he loved and very much served the Brahmins and all of the people that were under him. He had all transcendental good qualities. He was compared to Prahlad and Dhruva in his devotion, in his kindness to others in his self-control. As far as his charity, he was like Bali. As far as his principles, he was like Bhishma. Even the great kings of all the lands had such honor and respect for this cowherd man. Parjanya means a cloud, and he was like a cloud. 
torrential monsoon rainstorms of divine qualities were constantly showering from his good character. He had five sons. The eldest was Upananda, Abhinanda, Nanda, Sananda, and Nandana. Of them, the middle child, Nanda, he captured the hearts of everyone among the Brijabhasis and Goku. And there was another cowherd man of the name Sumuka. He had a daughter named Yashoda. And anything that connected to her became supremely auspicious. She brought fame and fortune wherever she cast her glance. Everyone simply was in love with her. Sumoka gave Yashoda in marriage to Nanda Maharaj. As the five children grew older, Parjani decided that he would coronate his eldest son as the ruler of the cowherd men and ladies, and he would go to the forest of Vrindavan to fix his mind, his heart, on the loving service of Lord Govinda. So there was a ceremony. Vasudev came from Mathura, Gargamuni, the high priest, came. Parjanya expressed his wish that he was now going to give the responsibility of the leadership of all the Brijabhasis to Upananda. Something very special happened then. Upananda stood up, walked over to Nanda Maharaj, and embraced him. He said, what I'm about to speak is not something that is just thought of at this moment, but with much consideration and deep realization, I'm going to express my will. Nanda Maharaj has conquered all of us with his love. He rules our hearts by his affection. His affection are the symptoms of his transcendental good qualities. We are all completely dependent on the affection that he is showering upon us. I will speak for the whole heaven of Gokul. I am going to voice what is in the hearts of all the Prajabhasis, that we all want Nanda Maharaj to be our king. But Upananda, in front of everyone, he put the royal tilak, and everyone cried out, Nanda Maharaj ki ja. And the devas even showered flowers on this auspicious occasion. Parjanya, he was just so happy to see the love among his friends. In a history of the world where there are so many power struggles for leadership, this is something very rare and very special. Here in India, we find Aurangzeb, 
who did so much damage to Vrindavan during a certain period. He imprisoned his father. He imprisoned or killed his elder brothers so that he could usurp the power of the kingdom. We see all over the world in democracy how one party will do anything to tear down another party to somehow or other get the power to rule. Even enemies become allies to, to gain a little more power over a common enemy. And in families, brothers fighting, going to courts, hating each other over some money and power. And here we find the spirit of Vrindavan. Upananda, he didn't want to rule, he just wanted to make everybody happy. And he understood that Nanda, his younger brother, by two brothers down, was so qualified, he could do the best service. He could make people the most happy. So let him be the king, and I will be his servant. And meanwhile, Nanda Maharaj had no ambition. As far as he was concerned, let Upananda, the rightful heir to the throne of Vrindavan, let him be the king, and I'll be his servant. And there was a competition of service. But the primal thought was always one thing. How the people could have the greatest benefits. And ultimately, by the will of all of, the, of his elder brothers and all the Brijabhasis, Nanda Maharaj accepted being Brajaraj, the king of Braja. And Upananda became his chief minister. Well, what was interesting about this, Jiva Goswami tells us, that Nanda Maharaj was completely obedient to surrender to anything Upananda told him to do, or even asked him to do. Not out of fear out of respect and out of love. Yes, this is the environment that the Supreme Personality of God wanted to appear within to perform his holy pastimes. Under Nanda Maharaj, everything was flourishing. Was so happy about everything. Crops were growing abundantly, the cows were giving quantities of milk coming, rivers were full with, with beautiful flowers and pure nectarine waters. But there was one thing that was deeply paining the hearts of all of the people of Vrindavan. Year after year passed, and Nanda and Yashoda did not have a child. Krishna wanted to be the child of Nanda and Yashoda because they are his eternal parents in the spiritual world. And therefore, Krishna, in the hearts of all the Brijabhasis, who is dear most intimate devotees, their, his wish to become their child was manifesting through their hearts. And Nanda and Yashoda, they had this deep, deep yearning to have a son. Upananda performed a yajna with some of the other leaders of Vrindavan. But nothing happened. One day, Nanda Maharaj spoke 
to Yashoda Mai. He said that the type of child that I'm yearning for in my heart cannot, cannot be the result of karmakanda yajyas. Something very different. Yashoda, practically day and night, I'm having this recurring vision. I'm seeing the most beautiful child that has ever been seen. He has lotus-like eyes. His every limb is soft like butter and fragrant like musk. And this little child with his sweet lips is smiling and laughing and I see him on your lap and you're holding him and embracing him and your motherly love is manifesting through milk springing from your breasts and this little child is hungry to drink that milk. This type of child that I'm seeing cannot be done through some yagyas. Only by the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yashoda Mai told Nanda Maharaj, I'm constantly seeing the same vision of the same child on my lap. I want to please Lord Narayana. Yashoda Mai said, We should one view. of them worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead and offering the fruits of their sincerest love to that child who was a meditation. Beautiful child that is the object of your love and meditation will become your son. Just after this, Yoga Maya, the internal potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, came to Vrindavan in the form of an elderly ascetic woman of the name Purnamasi. She had with her a young boy who was about the age where he just graduated younger school. When she came to Brinda or to Gokul, the Brijabasis were very attracted. And she told them. She said, I'm the mother of Sandipani Muni. I'm a disciple of Narada Muni. And I've come to bestow of what is about to happen here in the world. None will soon have a son, not an ordinary son, a most beautiful, loving son whose pastimes will totally enchant everyone's hearts. When this child comes, he will free Goku of all dangers everyone's hearts with the highest bliss and he will perform extraordinary activities. They were so happy to hear this good news. They celebrated. They said, stay here and live with us. So they made a little hut for her on the bank of the Yamuna out of leaves and straws. And she stayed there with her boy. And Purnamasi said, this child, his name is Madhu Mangal. And both of us, we never age. We are eternally exactly this age. Just after Purnamasi came to Gokul, 
Vasudev been tormented by Kansa in Mathura sent one of his wives, Rohini, who was then three months pregnant with his child on a horse-drawn chariot secretly to be under the shelter and care of Nanda Maharaj in Gokul. When Rohini Devi and Yashoda Mai met, the love between them, the bonding of their hearts was indescribable. One day, Nanda and Yashoda both had the same vision simultaneously. They saw that beautiful child of their dreams being carried by a celestial woman from the heart of Nanda to the heart of Yashoda. And then that celestial lady, the Yogamaya, she entered into the womb of Yashoda. Yashoda Mai manifested This was the cause of great joy and celebration for all of Brijabasis. Out of Yashoda Mai's motherly love to give pleasure to her child within her heart, her womb, She had a hunger for whatever Krishna loved to eat. She would get hungry for very special rice that was cooked with camphor and ghee and milk and very, very sweet, pure, natural sugars. And whatever Krishna liked, she'd be hungry for that. On the seventh month of Rohini's pregnancy, on Krishna's instruction, Yoga Maya caused Rohini to wake up at midnight after she had a dream that she just had a miscarriage. She was shocked and she realized that it wasn't a dream. She actually had a miscarriage, so she was feeling very bad. But then Yoga Maya spoke to Rohini and said, actually, I am transferring the child of Devaki's womb into your womb. Rohini is the eternal mother of Balaram. Rohini, according to Jiva Goswami, was pregnant for 14 months just so that Balaram would be about the same age as Krishna, so they could really be brothers and share their pastimes together. On the full moon night of the month of Shravan, Balaram Jayanti, Sri Balaramji was born in Goku. And soon after that, on the eighth day of the month of Bhadra, Krishna appeared in Gokul to Nanda and Yashoda. When Krishna appeared from the heart of Yashoda Mai, by Yoga Maya's mystical potency, she was so tired that she didn't really know exactly what was happening. Meanwhile, at the exact same time, at midnight in Mathura, Lord Narayan emerged from the womb of Devaki with his forearm form, 
holding the conch shell and the disc and the club and the lotus flower. Vasudeva and Devaki in the prison cell, bound by shackles. They offered prayers of devotion to the Supreme Personality of Godhead who appeared as their son. And in her motherly affection, Devaki prayed to Krishna in his Vasudeva feature that Kamsa has been waiting all these years for you to be born just to kill you. He's already killed six of my children. My seventh has been a miscarriage. If he sees you in this beautiful form of Vishnu, he'll know that you are his, his enemy and he may cause you some harm. So or disguise this form of yours. Just when she made that prayer, Yoga Maya carried like a flower in, like a like flower pollen in the wind. She carried Yashoda Nandana Krishna from Gokul to my. And without anybody knowing what was happening, Lord, the forearm form of Vasudev merged into the little two-arm form of Krishna, the son of Yashoda. Vasudev was told previously to take the boy to Gokul and leave him on the bedside of Yashoda Mai. Just when this incredible pastime took place, where little baby Krishna with two arms lovingly glancing upon Vasudeva and Devaki, everyone in Kamsa's prison cell, in his whole kingdom, they all fell asleep. The doors opened. The shackles unlocked. Vasudev took the little baby. The river Yamuna was flooding. There was rains. Ananta Shesha came like an umbrella so that not a drop would go on Krishna's little body. The Yamuna parted for Vasudev and he came to go cool to the house of Nanda. Meanwhile, while all this was happening, Yoga Maya, as the younger brother of, younger sister of Krishna, took birth from Yashoda. It was laying next to her as Yashoda Maya was soundly sleeping. And Vasudev put the little baby boy on the bed and took Yoga Maya, the little girl away. And we all know what the Srimad Bhagavatam tells us. When he came back into the prison cell and the shackles fastened again and all the doors locked and everybody woke up and the little baby girl cried, Kamsa was immediately notified and he ran down and he picked up that little baby girl and Bhaktivaki was pleading and crying, you've killed all my sons, this is a girl, you have nothing to fear. Just allow me to have one child. I'm your sister. He mercilessly lifted her up to smash her to death on a piece of stone. But the little girl slipped out of his hands, went into the air, and manifested the form of Durga with eight arms riding on a lion. She said, Kamsa, you are a fool. Why are you harassing your sister and brother-in-law in this way? You do not know, but the child who was meant to kill you has already been born somewhere else. Then she disappeared. 
Kamsa became quite sober at that moment. And it didn't last much longer than that. Ah, she does, she had evil. Kamsa fell at Devaki and Bhaktivedanta's feet and begged forgiveness. And can you imagine, he started preaching philosophy to them. He said, I'm really sorry I've caused you so much pain. You're my own sister and brother-in-law. I've kept you in prison. I've tortured you. I've killed all your children. But you should know that, you know, these are all, these things happen by the laws of karma. And you can't really blame people. It's all the way of providence. And Vasudev and Devaki completely forgave him and blessed him. They were such loving Vaishnav devotees. And then he let them free. But they knew it wasn't going to last. Because as soon as Kamsa was in the association of these very, very power-hungry, envious people, they would corrupt his mind again because he was so vulnerable. And again, soon after, he was going to put them in prison. But meanwhile, Yashoda Mai woke up and laying next to her was Gopal, who is the supreme reservoir of all opulences. The name Krishna means all attractive. In Vishnu Purana describes Bhagavan, who is all attractive, if possesses all in whatever beautiful in that. spark of my supreme infinite nature. We have an experience of how we could be infatuated or enamored by the things It's because Whatever exists is just a spark, not even a tiny particle of a ray of the infinite sun of Krishna's opulences. And here, the supreme reservoir of all beauty, the supreme object of all love, in the form of an apparently helpless little infant baby was lying on the bedside of Yashoda. And she is totally enraptured, knowing absolutely for sure that this is my son who has come from my womb. She looked at Krishna's beautiful little face and tears were pouring from her eyes in love and the love of her heart was manifesting in every way. Her hairs were standing on end in, in motherly affection. Milk was streaming from her breasts. Her heart was dancing in ecstasy as she embraced her little baby. And Krishna not only took birth as the child of Yashoda, Krishna took birth at that same moment in the hearts of all the Brijabhasis, all the older gopas and gopis. They could feel the presence of this little Gopal in their hearts. How did they feel it? 
with an overpowering, uncontrollable, indescribable surge of love. They knew the child was born. Rohini and other gopis, they went to Yashoda Mai's room and there they saw little Gopal. The same way that Yashoda Mai fell in love with the child, everyone in spontaneously. Krishna was the child of Yashoda. But everyone felt, all the older gopas and gopis felt, he's my child. There was no envy, there was no competition. Krishna can fulfill everyone's desires simultaneously. Rohini sent an elderly Brahmin lady to inform Nanda Maharaj. When that Brahmin lady came to the cow shed, just at the time when all the cows were being milked, she looked so happy that as soon as everyone, all the cowherd men handed by Upananda, Abhinanda, Nanda, Sunanda, and Nandana, as soon as they saw her, they understood the most auspicious news we have all been yearning for. It's happened. But they wanted to hear it. They asked, what have you come to tell us? And she was so emotional. She was in such transcendental ecstasy. It was so difficult to talk because she was just so happy. Have any of you ever experienced where you are so unlimitedly happy you can't even talk? But somehow or other, she talked. And she said, that child, Nanda, he has been born. And Nanda Maharaj began dancing. All the cowherd men, it was like after a hot drought of summer, when monsoon rains pour down in a forest, the peacocks dance in ecstasy with their tails raised. In that way, Nanda and all the gopas to dance and celebrate. Nanda Maharaj went to his house, he took his bath, he put on clean clothes. He was so much in anticipation of seeing his new son, Gopal. He was rushing to the place where Yashoda Mai was sitting with his child and he would, he would just fall unconscious and then get up and, and walk a few more steps and fall unconscious and somehow or other he made it there. There was a curtain. It was closed. Yashoda Mai was on the other side of the curtain. And Rohini, she told Yashoda Mai that Nanda Maharaj is here. And Rohini took the little baby and she brought it and put it in the arms of Nanda Maharaj. And the curtain opened. And when Yashoda Mai heard and saw the happiness of her husband, it multiplied her happiness. Nanda Maharaj called for a beautiful festival to bless his child. The day is Nandotsava, where Brahmins were chanting mantras and they were doing yagyas and there was instruments playing and there was Harinam Sankirtan being sung. And everyone was so joyous. They were dressed in their best clothes just to invoke auspiciousness upon this family. And they celebrated in so many ways. Srila Prabhupada explains that the wealth of the gopas and the gopis was in their grains and in their milk products. So they were so happy. They were exchanging love with each other by throwing butter and yogurt and ghee on each other. Now, 
One time we tried that at Radhagopinath Temple. <laughs> and it really created a mess. <laughs> it, took, it took many hours to clean up. Do you remember, Govind? <laughs> this cannot be done artificially because love can be exchanged in many wonderful ways. But you see, among the Brijabhasis in Gokul, this was the gifts of God to them. The beautiful opulences that were provided by the cows, milk and yogurt and butter and ghee and other such sweetmeats that they were making with each other. This was precious. This was more valuable than diamonds or rubies or gold or platinum or anything else people consider, or even land. So they were ex for God by sharing their love for Krishna with each other, by making each other happy by sharing these loving exchanges. You see, what gives anything meaning is the affection of the intent of an exchange. Srila Prabhupada writes, Krishna does not accept everything that is offered. He accepts the purpose and the intent of that thing. Things could give some flickering pleasure to the mind and senses, but things can never give any satisfaction to the heart. Only love gives satisfaction to the heart. And when love is centered on the eternal truth, of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the ultimate object of everyone's love. When we share our love for Krishna with each other, when there's actual affection, then whatever we offer is priceless.